This episode is supported by AdamandEve.com. For 50% off almost any item, the Valentine's Day Romance Kit, and free shipping, go to AdamandEve.com and use promo code MULTI. Jesus. What? You're like... You're like the person they would hire to do their radio ad. Uh, <laughs> please do it, Miss Adam and Eve out there, Mr. Yeah. and Mrs. Eve and <laughs> Adam. And Mrs. Eve. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're talking with Andrew Gerza, a disability awareness consultant and crippled content creator. He's also the host of Disability After Dark, the show that shines a bright light on sex and disability. In his work, he seeks to explore how the lived experience of disability feels as it interplays with intersectional communities. Um, And he's just a fucking awesome guy. Yeah, I loved this interview. It's awesome. Yeah. Really, really enjoyed speaking with them. Yeah. Also, uh, oh yes, you wanted to say something? No, I was just going to say that we we I first was introduced to his podcast maybe a year ago or so, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's only been around for about a year and a half. Um, but uh, yeah, about a year ago, and I thought, man, that's a cool show. I need to get him on our show, uh, and so we finally, finally did. Yeah. And so yeah, I'm glad that we finally had Andrew on our show today. Yes, and. Uh, Dedeker is gone? I don't know. What she's, she's not here she gone? Week. Uh, yeah, she's not here this week, so yes. it's just the two of us with Andrew as our third co-host this week. Yeah, so, so Dedeker, watch out. Your job may be replaced. Exactly. We have a new third host. New sheriff in town. <laughs> new sheriff in and town. And with that... Yeah. Um, anyway, in this episode, uh, we get into all sorts of great stuff kind of from some basics mm-hmm. to things that are a little more in depth than that. Um, and it's, uh, I feel like it was a really valuable episode for me personally. Oh, me too. Um, and I hope that it is for all of you as well. Cause this is something that we haven't talked about on our show at all before mm-hmm. about both sex and also just relationships and dating with disabilities. Yeah. Um, so with that, Let's get to the interview. So welcome, Andrew, to the podcast. Thank you so much for being on. Um, I just wanted to start out with your specific podcast, Disability After Dark, is really awesome and amazingly candid and really open. I just wanted to ask for our listeners out there who haven't um, potentially listened to your podcast yet, what is the message of it? Like, What type of information are you hoping that your listeners will get from listening to your podcast? The message is shining a bright light on sex and disability uh that's really really all it is and it started out i started it a year and a half ago really wanting to go deeper into sex and disability that's kind of morphed into just talking about sexuality generally with a loose link to disability because the more and more i do it and the more and more i talk to people about sexuality and disability it it has grown so much in a way that isn't just about the physical act of sex or even the emotional act of sex. So, I mean, there's so much more to it. Like, next week there'll be an episode, or by the time this airs, it'll be out, but there'll be an episode (laughs) about me and drag, and, like, there's stuff around identity, and it's it's so much bigger than I thought it was going to be. So the message is just, like, let's have a really frank conversation about sexuality, generally, identity, gender, ability, disability, all those things are part of it now. So the message has really grown to just let's talk about sexuality as it is with relation to disability. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to kind of skip ahead a little bit here, but it, you have an after dark in your, uh, in your title of your podcast. So like we, for example, tend to talk a little bit more about relationships and you obviously are talking a lot about sex 
And did you feel like there was something missing, like, out in the grand land of podcasts out there that, like, you really felt like you wanted to have sex be a big part of your podcast specifically? I'm a sexual, I'm just a sexual person, and I wanted yeah. to talk about that. And I, and I had been blogging for HuffPost and for other outlets and for The Advocate and Mashable and all those things. And when you're when you're disabled, sometimes typing is, for me, typing's not the easiest sometimes, and I get tired easily when I type a lot. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I can just, I'll just podcast and see if that <laughs> translates. And, you know, at the time, like a year and a half ago, that was, you know, what people were doing, and that was kind of the cool new thing, not even well before then, but <laughs> yeah. it's it's been a thing for a couple of years now. So I was like, well, let I looked around, there were so few podcasts talking about sex and disability, and I was like, I already have this market that I'm growing. Why don't I just turn into a podcast and see what happens? And this is where we are. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on your on your website, like one of the things that you say is that your goal as a disability awareness consultant is to bring the experience of disability to you in a way that is open, fun, and above all else, accessible. And so yeah. what we wanted to do on this episode was to cover kind of some of that, like we call it a 101. We've actually recently had a number of 101 style episodes about like relationship anarchy 101, polyamory 101. Uh, so we'd love to cover some of that and then hopefully also get into a little like deeper questions as well as we go through that. Yeah, sure. First, I'll say I'm happy to, I love 101s, but that's so much of what I do in my job. Mm. Um, I think we need to get to a place where we stop asking disabled people like, how do you have sex? Oh my God, you have sex? Like, wow, that's, let's, let's be shocked by that. We need to get to a place where the shock and awe of the fact that somebody who has disabilities would want to be sexual goes away. And it's not, it's not brave to be sexual and disabled. It's not inspiring to be sexual and disabled. It just is mm. part of what it is. So when I do one-on-ones, I try to talk about like the deeper stuff and I try to bring people into my experience because we know we think we know what disability is but we don't know we don't know how it feels we often don't know how it feels and I do because I live it every day and so do so many other people but also with my podcast I don't know how some invisible disabilities feel I don't know how some um some mental illness chronic illnesses feel I don't know how all that feels so when I invite a guest on, half the time I'm just listening, being like, "Wow, I didn't think about this." Like, "Wow, thanks for." So, when I give and when I give a lecture, I am giving them 101, but I'm showing them that there's more to it than how does Andrew have sex. Like, if you <laughs> want to know if you want to know how to fuck me, come over and if if we sex, then <laughs> we'll try like, it sometime. Then you give the real 101. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. I love that you talked about disabilities or the things that. Um, people can't see right in front of them, but that may also be prevalent and that should be talked about as well and thought about as well. That's really awesome. Yeah. And I mean, that's something that even I, even my own privilege didn't allow me to see until I had other disabled people with non invisible disabilities come up to me and say, well, you're not really doing it. Like you haven't spoken about our experience a lot. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do to fix that? And at first I was like, Oh wow. I didn't even realize I'm just like, okay, like, all right. And then the more and more I talked to individuals with multi multiple levels of disability, you notice that like they, they just, they need a space to talk. So when I'm talking to an individual with invisible disabilities, I'll say like, okay, I'm super ignorant about this show me this and so i think as a wheelchair user too because i'm a wheelchair user you you unintentionally feel like oh my wheelchair is the only way to be disabled and that's just not true and so by listening to these other voices i'm becoming so much more intersectional just by shutting up and listening and letting them tell me like hey i'm a person with an invisible disability and i like sex this way or i like to do this and it's so eye-opening for me which is why like I love doing episodes where I'm talking about my own experience but when I have a guest where I can just sit and go wow okay like tell me more about this like and let them it and I know that the audience is going to be hearing that going what okay maybe my experience is here maybe maybe like I'm represented too it's so nice to know that 
that it isn't just a white guy in a wheelchair talking about how hard it is being a white guy in a wheelchair. Mm. Trying to have sex. Yeah. So something that um, I think especially over the past year, but um, even before that, doing our show, uh, that we'll get feedback from our listeners um, kind of calling us out on things that either we haven't done a good job of representing or certain things that we say dead wrong yeah right like language that we use that we had no idea even you know despite our best efforts to be inclusive uh you know like a a simple example of this is we had an episode where we were talking about labels and how it's difficult when the world kind of puts labels on polyamorous relationships because sometimes that doesn't always fit but that in our conversation about it we referred to women that we've dated as girls that we've dated and someone called us out on it being like, Hey, actually like calling yeah, women yeah. girls is infantilizing and is, you know, not a great thing to do. And we were just like, geez, you're right. We've done that for a long time now. So we've worked hard together to change our language around that. Um, more recently, it's been things like crazy, like saying like, gosh, this is crazy good or man, it's just been crazy lately people pointing out like, hey, actually, that's kind of ableist against people who are actually called crazy because of a mental disability that they have. Um, So in the spirit of that, I was wondering if we could kind of start out this sort of 101 course with a little bit of that, like what are some things that are not okay to say and language wise and sort of what are things that are okay? That's a loaded question because my my moniker is queer cripple, so I mm. go against what is politically correct and what's not politically correct to say. I'm very outspoken about the language I use to describe myself. Mm-hmm. I think when you're dealing with another disabled person, you, just much like how we're doing with the non-binary and trans communities right now, where we're asking, hey, what are your pronouns? We need to adopt the same idea around disability identity and say like hey i see you have a disability or i I noticed you mentioned you have a non-visible disability how would you like me to refer to you to to you and to that and let them tell you what they decide because if you ask me what my what my preferred term is i'll tell you queer cripple that's like that's what you should call me and especially if if you're somebody that i'm fucking that's what i prefer to be (laughs) referred to as so um that's what i'll say like but I think language needs to move from move away from person first identity. So like person with a disability is the right. correct quote unquote correct term. The sure. I think we need to look at preferred language. So if somebody says I am handy capable, as much as that makes me cringe, if they told me that was their preferred l- moniker, I would have to respect it because that's what they asked me to call them at. So. But I think we have to start like asking disabled people, what do you what do you want to be called? Like what is your what do you prefer? And it gives us the agency to say, actually, you can call me fucking cripple fucker. That's what I like. It gives us the agency to decide what we want to be called. Period. Right. So, does that answer the question? Sort of. Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's interesting because I think it's it's a difficult question because like for example on your show where you you know refer to yourself as a, a queer cripple and you will refer to like your crip cock and things like that i love that so much and, <laughs> and things uh, i don't remember saying but i'm sure oh I my did. god it, no, yeah you I did cracking up <laughs> <laughs> um but uh you know stuff like that where like i don't know if that's something that you would want me to call you, or if that's only something you know for you if to say, about you, yourself, if we so. were making out and we were <laughs> in having sexy times together, yeah, I would probably be okay with that. Huh. Um, and I've asked partners who I'm sleeping with to, to like playfully, if they wanted to, call me that or give me a nickname that in, incorporates disability because it forces them to see it for what it is, and it show it proves to me that you're comfortable if you spend the whole time we're together tiptoeing around like oh my god how do i handle this whereas if you just laugh with me and call me a cripple and we laugh together and i've given you permission to do that like don't i'm not saying go up to go up to a disabled person on the street and be like hey cripple what's up like that's not no <laughs> right, if, sure. we're, if we're messing around or we're friends and we're hanging out and i say to you please call me cripple because it allows for you to see me that's a big deal Mm. It's a, it's a badge of honor that you should be like, wow, Andrew, like let me into this part of his identity, especially if we're if we're 
having sexy moments together, then I would ex- like, I would hope you're comfortable enough to make those jokes with me because, and I mean, the discomfort around the humor. Sometimes I don't want to make f- jokes about it, but I feel like if I don't, what if the other person doesn't ever relax? Like I, I use it as a testing mechanism to see like, where is this other person going to be okay with things? I'm not sure. So, yeah. That's awesome. Well, and it's it's interesting you bring that up too, because in your episode about uh, your Huffington Post article, the four things that you should never say to a queer cripple before, during, or after sex, uh, that you said actually there was a lot of backlash against using the word cripple in that, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. <laughs> Every time, whenever I post an article and use the word cripple, before even reading the article, yeah. somebody will be like, well, you shouldn't use that word. It's demeaning. And I'm like, well, did, but did you did you read what like the rest of the 2,000 word article said about the thing I was writing about? Like, did you yeah. read what I said? And so, like, that article, the, the editor of HuffPost at the time had to step in and be like, whoa, we're not going to, we're going to let him use the language he wants to. Don't, like, take a breath. But it's mostly able-bodied people running to my defense of like, oh my God, how could you say that it's so derogatory? I mean, yes, yes it was, and yes it is in certain contexts, but I've taken it back for myself. And again, if I don't know you and you walk up to me on the street and start yelling cripple, I'm going to probably not like that. But if I know you and we're friends and I've said to you like, hey, maybe after we have sex this morning, you could call me this, or maybe during the sex, you could call me this, like then it... Like I said, it's a it's a it's a form of of reclamation for me. Actually, like next week, I'm getting a tattoo of the words "queer cripple" on my chest because oh, wow. cool. it's such an important terminology for me, and it's how I made my job. It's what I've do- it's how I built my name around those terms. And I've said I don't fucking care what you think about me. I'm gonna put these two once horribly derogatory terms on my body and say this is now my power. Hmm. this is my power language i'm right. owning it and if you want to like get on this ride with me you should probably know that that's how i refer to myself yeah um on that note can you tell us what the four things that you should never say to a queer cripple before during or after sex are or give us enough of a preview so people can learn something but then they can go listen to your episode yeah. to get the rest of it the <laughs> i i should I I should probably pull that. I haven't looked at that in a while. <laughs> um, all right. So the four things you should never ask a queer cripple before, during, or after sex are: please, please don't tell me that taking care of me isn't that hard. If uh, if before, during, or after the sex you have to move my body or or help me out in some way r- with respect to disability, please don't tell me that it was so. It was so nice taking care of you. Or it was so easy. Please don't do that. It, it's super infantilizing. Um, yeah. And I, it, it will make me not want to ever have sexy times with you ever again. <laughs> it's super weird. And I don't appreciate being infantilized right after I did a thing with you or during the thing or before the thing. So, so right. yeah. yeah. Um, the next thing is please don't ask me during sex if I can get it up. It's super uncomfortable and if you ask me just as you're about to go down on me if i can get it up then i'm never gonna be able to get it up and also yeah, as a, that was my thought when you said that <laughs> i was just like jesus if someone asked me that like i'm definitely not getting it up then exactly yeah and also as a disabled person you might be dealing with erectile dysfunction problems you might have medications that require that you can't get an erection fully like like somebody who doesn't deal with all that stuff so asking that question is full of ableist stuff that we have to stop doing. And I think the trouble, especially in my experience as a queer man, a queer cisgendered man who has only currently spent time with other cisgendered men, the idea of being erect is like how we view arousal, which is just so like backwards and a little bit archaic. Like, can we... It's very narrow, yeah. Like... I'm not saying I don't enjoy an erect penis right now and then, but I, I do feel like it's just so... Why would you ask somebody that ever? Because it would... you they Then they would get in their heads. I mean, even yeah. if you totally. weren't disabled and you ask your partner like, hey, can you get it up right now? <laughs> I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, let me um, just do that not anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, then after that, one, the next thing you should never do is, you know... You should never. Ask, you should never ask somebody if I were you. 
You never say to a disabled person after, before, during, or after sex, if I were you, I would kill myself. Um, I had a partner once. We, we didn't even actually end up, ha- we didn't even actually end up having sex. Um, we were just kind of flirting with the idea mm-hmm. and he was helping me get ready to, uh, he was one of my attending care workers and we were kind of like playing with the idea of maybe fooling around after we had stopped working for each other. Um, and he was like, you know, if I were you, I'd kill myself. It's so powerful that you just live every day and you're alive. And I was like, what? I was like, I don't know it's how. It's mind-blowing. Jeez. Like, I'm never going to want to spend time with you again. And, and he said it with such genuine, like, feeling of, like, he didn't even realize what he was saying was weird and uncomfortable. And I remember being with him and just being like, I don't. And he was also my care worker at the time, so I had to deal with him for mm-hmm after that and i just oh, got wow. quiet i didn't, I didn't realize. say anything i didn't say because what do you say when someone's like if i were you i'd be dead yeah like, like thank you uh, like I, what do you what do you say um i have no idea <laughs> and then one of one of the most interesting moments that i've ever had with the lover ever in my whole life i met this guy on an app a couple years ago and we were gonna mess around and he was he came over to my place and we were messing around. We we're making out really pretty passionately. We we're gonna get down to the you know the the heavy mm-hmm. stuff soon, and we're we're doing it. And he stops. And he goes, I have to stop. I have to stop. And I was like, okay, like what's going on? What's happening? And he was like, um, you kind of remind me of my ex girlfriend's dead disabled son. What the and fuck? I, yeah, and I was like, uh, what? Um, how do I? How does one? What? And he he was like, well, yeah. He was a kid, and he like d- he passed away, and he was in a wheelchair too. And I was like, "Cool, but I um, uh, like, and I just didn't know. I didn't. I honestly was like flabbergasted. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do. So I asked him to leave because I was like, I can't, I can't get into this now. Like what? So, but I think telling somebody that they remind you, like telling a disabled person during the throes of sex that they remind you of this other disabled person even if it isn't as creepy as that you remind me of my ex-girlfriend's dead disabled kid you probably shouldn't like you should be spending time with the person you're with and not comparing like well this one time when i was with this other disabled person this happened like no if we're doing this like don't like i think people need to realize that when you're hanging out with and go back to go back to the 101 part of this thing when you're hanging out with a disabled person especially for the first time especially when you're both vulnerable and naked and you might be getting having some sex you're going to say something ableist you're good it just it's going to happen you're going to say something inappropriate you're going to do something wrong and that's okay i think what i think what disabled people need to realize too is that if you're fucking a non-disabled person they're going to say something stupid they're gonna <laughs> say something inappropriate. They're gonna, they're gonna, as I used to say, I don't say it much anymore, but I'll bring it back for this. They're gonna, instead of putting their foot in, in their mouth, they're gonna swallow, swallow their leg. They're gonna say something <laughs> really inappropriate. They're gonna, and they won't mean it. They won't have no idea how inappropriate it is. And you have two choices. If you don't like the person, you go ahead and like give them a, oh my god, I can't believe you. Why would? You? But if you wanna, you know, really spend time with the person, you have the opportunity. Not the obligation. I want to make that clear. Not the mm-hmm. obligation. The opportunity to say like, "Hey, so that thing you did just there was kind of weird for me, and here's why." And you can lay out like, "I felt like this," and blah blah. And again, you don't have to if you don't have the energy or the desire or the want. Especially mm-hmm. if you sometimes if you just want to fuck. You don't really want to spend time dealing with their ableism. But if you like the person and can see something continuing, you can say like. Actually, maybe you don't do this again. But I think as an able-bodied person, if you're going to hook up with another disabled person, you can be sure you're going to say something really inappropriate. And it's not that it's... I mean, we all, it's so complicated because it's not okay, but it is okay because you should learn from it and move mm-hmm. on and ho- try not to do it again. But you're going to stumble because disability is, so, is something that's still so taboo and so so new and so so like oh, wow and like most people have never been with a disabled person sexually and so they don't know how to act they don't know how to be they don't know what's appropriate and so mm-hmm. it's okay and it's also okay to be a non, non-disabled person 
I think, in my opinion, it's okay to be a non-disabled person and come into those situations and be like, okay, so I think you're really hot, but I have no fucking clue what I'm doing. Um, before I go down on you, how about we have a discussion about that or just be aware that I'm going to do something probably weird and uh, just be ready for that and that's okay. And let's, like, there's something kind of endearing to have somebody be mm. like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I've never done this before, but I think you're kind of hot and I'd like to get you out of your wheelchair and fuck, you or fuck around with you. Like, there's something really adorable about that and more people would just <laughs> do that as opposed to trying to be really politically correct mm. i think the trouble with especially disability is we've been taught never to say something wrong we've been taught never to we've been taught to walk on eggshells around disabled people all the time and that's a nice idea but when you're about to like suck somebody off or give them a head or get naked with them you're you're vulnerable so you're gonna stumble and that's okay i've stopped like I have done really crappy, weird things too. And been like, oh, I never realized. So sorry. But like, you can just move on and you just don't try not to do it again. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's a really, I'm, I'm thinking about it too. Cause we've, that reminds me a lot of things we've talked about on other episodes for, um, you know, any kind of, I guess, minority for lack of a better word, but whether it's cause you're polyamorous or because you're, a certain race or you're from a certain country, there is that thing of like, people are probably going to fuck up. Like I've had people say some pretty offensive things about polyamory to me with the best of intentions with being like yeah. super fascinated. I want to learn more about it and saying something that I'm like in my head, I'm like, God, what you said was horrible, but like kind of making that choice, like you said of, do I want to take the time right now to say, well, actually you know that's like not, that's and, a little bit and, weird yeah, to say and not usually cuz usually i'm in the in the throes of nakedness with this person or i'm like i maybe if i if i if i chew them out right now maybe they won't fuck me again and the sex is really good and so there's like there's like right. many yeah. reasons why i don't confront and like i said i have said ableist things about people too in in the work i do and i've said things that i that i wish i could take back sometimes and people have had to correct me and be like andrew wait a minute what about this and it's a learning experience, and I think we need to be open to, especially in our social social justice warrior like 2018 mm-hmm. world. The we need to be climate, open. Yeah, yeah, we need to be open to like. I made a mistake. I'm really sorry about it. I like. Can I? Can I get another chance? And I'm not mm-hmm. saying that that's always the easiest thing to grant somebody, but I think when it comes to disability. <sighs> A lot of disabled people have a right to be angry, very, very angry about a lot of stuff that's happened to them, and I get it, and I'm I'm angry too, but I'm trying to turn that anger into something productive for myself, because I could sit and, t- and spend a whole hour with the two of you talking about how every relationship that I've ever had has been a one-night stand and how it sucks and blah, 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 but that doesn't... That doesn't that doesn't help me. That just that just spirals it out. So instead of that, I was like, let's create a podcast and talk about, you know, bring all the stuff that I'm annoyed about into a forum where I can talk about it. And I think disabled people have not an obligation because no one's obligated to, but they have an opportunity to take their experience and show able-bodied people and non-disabled people who, by the way, will eventually become disabled in one way or another. So mm. get ready, you will become one of us. Um, <laughs> And when, you know, just sharing that experience with somebody if they want to. And it makes, I think, sex and sexuality much more fun if you're open to kind of living in the mis- living in, in the fact that you will make a mistake. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that opportunity that you're talking about is just so great. Because I think, I don't know, a lot of people tend to be like, no, I'm just going to write you off 100% because you made this mistake and you're therefore a bad person. But it sounds yeah. like you really tend to just say, you know, this is a learning opportunity. I mean, not all the time. There are definitely sure. times where I'm like, fuck you, that was horrible, sure. don't say that again, like blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't, That I'm learning, and I'm learning especially in the end of 2017 to, the, to early 2018, that's not getting me anywhere mm-hmm. anymore. That's really, it's exhausting to be mad at people for things they don't understand. I just have to power through and do my own stuff and hope that through my work and through like being how hot I am, somebody <laughs> will <laughs> somebody will eventually, you know, realize that, that I have stuff to offer and if they want to give it a shot, here I am. Yeah. Um, 
All right. So I have a question for you about the times that you've gone and, and spoken at places like that. Um, in terms of like these sort of 101 things, like you were saying, it's tiring to do them, but you also understand that they're valuable to do. Um, I've, I've been really curious about like, have there been things that have really surprised you that people even needed to ask at all? Or does it all kind of make sense? Are you like, yeah, okay. I get why you would ask like, how do you have sex or, or. I did a, I did a lecture a couple years ago. I did, I did a university lecture with this girl and she's in the front row and she's asking, I said, okay, time to ask whatever you want about, about the lecture we just had. And she goes, she looks me dead in the eye after an hour and a half lecture and goes, so wait, you actually have sex? What the and fuck? I, and I looked at her and I had to be professional, right? I had to like take a breath. <sighs> yeah, actually I do. And inside I was like, wait, didn't you just pay attention? Where have you been? Where were you now for 90 minutes to where I just did all this? So like when people, I think when, I, especially when I'm lecturing to, to classrooms, I feel like sometimes they're mandated to be there by their, their class. Mm, so they right. don't, they're not paying attention. So I always feel like, and sometimes I, they're on their phone yeah, or something and sometimes i get frustrated because it's like usually it's able-bodied people that i'm lecturing to about the like the one-on-one mm -hmm. of disability and i'd love to do a class or a lecture where it's all other disabled people who we uh, instead of me lecturing for 90 minutes with like my powerpoints about how great my dick is and how you should all fuck a disabled guy and how great <laughs> it is because i do have those <laughs> uh but you know other than doing that i wish i could do a, a series where me and a bunch of disabled people are just sitting in a room talking about sex. Like that would be an amazing lecture series um, because that doesn't happen very often. Usually I am lecturing to non-disabled, cisgendered, white people who don't, who have never had any experience with disability or if they do, they're in the room and they're too shy to tell me and they'll come up afterwards and be like, actually I'm dealing with this, like thank you for your lecture and we'll be all shy about it and I'll be like why didn't hmm. I wish you ha I wish uh. you felt safe enough to have a space where you could say like I am I have this disability and I want to talk about sexuality this way and I did have somebody in a lecture in the states in uh, Illinois a couple years ago stop me midway hmm. through my lecture and say well what are you doing for people with uh, with um, cognitive disabilities and, and impairments and I had to stop and go I literally said I'm not, I had to say I'm not doing anything right now, but thank you for letting me know because I have to figure it out. I also feel uncomfortable doing stuff like that where I am not somebody with a cognitive disability, so I don't feel like I have a right to speak on that. And it's stuff that I want to do for Disability After Dark. I want to talk to people with intellectual disabilities about consent and stuff like that, but I want to bring them on the show to talk to me. I don't have a right to, to pretend like I know what I'm talking about when I don't. And... I think that's my privilege. So uh, like I said earlier, a lot of the show is me putting out calls to guests saying, hey, do you want to tell me your story? Because I don't want to speak for you. I want you to come and share. I want to use the, the, the podcast as a platform, not just for me to get my stuff out, but also to be like, come and feel safe to tell your story about sexuality, whatever it is, as a disabled person. Mm -hmm. We want to take a quick break from this show to talk about some ways that you can help support us and help keep this show going, help support our efforts to do live shows, as well as having amazing guests like Andrew on. If you're getting value out of this show and you're not already a Patreon, if you could become a Patreon supporter, it would help us so much. That is patreon.com slash multiamory. And there you can choose to pledge a certain amount of money every month to help us to keep doing this show and to help grow this thing that we're doing and get this message out there to more people. Uh, for example, at the $5 a month level, we have a private Facebook group that we'll invite you to where you can talk with other people openly about being non-monogamous or maybe about dating non-monogamous people, even if you yourself are more monogamous or more relationship anarchy, any of that, have a place where you can openly talk about that get support from other people, hear other people's stories. At the $7 a month level, we have ad-free episodes that also come out a day before everyone Our else gets to listen to it. Tier. 
So when everyone deal. else listens to the show, you can be like, oh yeah, I already listened to that yesterday. I heard it yesterday, yeah. but it didn't even come out yesterday. Well, but for me, it did. For me, it did. Exactly. I'm a $7 patron, yo. <laughs> yes. Um, and then we also, like at the $9 level, have our monthly video discussion group, um, which is also an amazing community. Uh, but all of these are great ways to get, to be the first one in the know about upcoming things like live shows or about... They're coming up. They're coming up. And if you're a patron, you'll be the first to know. So with that... They were uh, the first to know. Yeah. We would love to have your support and have you as part of our patron community. And to do that again is patreon.com slash multiamory. The next thing you can do if you don't want to spend any money or if you don't have any to spend is to write us a review. Take a moment to write us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Uh, The reviews aren't just to make us feel good it also helps other people to listen to the show uh it really does make a big difference it usually takes a number of people recommending something like a podcast for someone to actually check it out and try it and your review is part of that if someone sees that and goes oh wow okay this person said this is what was helpful for them about it maybe i'll give it a try that that really does help it also helps us show up higher in search results and higher in the rankings on itunes so if you could take a moment if you haven't already to write us a nice review on iTunes or Stitcher. That will also help our show a lot and doesn't cost you anything but a couple minutes of your time. And helps us out. Yeah. And finally, our lovely sponsor for this week is adamandeve.com. So Valentine's Day is coming up, Mm -hmm. which means that in addition to our normal 50% off of almost any item in the store, you're going to get a free romance kit. So there's a bunch of little goodies in there for y'all, for you, for your partners, um, for everyone and anyone. (laughs) Uh, And they get free shipping. And they get free shipping as well. So it's so many amazing things. Um, And just use promo code MULTI, M-U-L-T-I at checkout. You'll get that 50% off the free romance kit and free shipping. So this romance kit, if you want to get it, it is only available if you use our promo code through the 14th. So the promo code for 50% off MULTI is always there. But if you want that free additional romance kit, then you have to order by the 14th of February. Which is Valentine's Day. (laughs) Yes, which is Valentine's Day. (laughs) In case you didn't know. Clearly, I'm assuming they probably knew that. February 14th is Valentine's Day. So use your promo code by then, get that 50% off, get the free shipping, and your special romance kit. Now back to you, Andrew. You've been saying recently on your podcast, too, that you are like actively looking for suggestions of topics as well. All the time. That that's, yeah. So to our listeners out there, if you're hearing this and going, oh my God, yes, like this... I feel like he could talk about something that relates to me or something I've wanted to know about. Uh, you know who to talk to. <laughs> Go talk to Andrew. About totally. it. <laughs> Tell him what you want to cover. Yeah. I mean, that's similarly, you know, that's why we're excited to have you on this show. Cause this is obviously something that neither of us can speak about right now. Um, I was curious about, um, we talked about this a little bit before the show, but um, like, are you, polyamorous non-monogamous like what kind of relationships do you have uh (laughs) it's a loaded deep question because usually my relationships start and end with thank you for the one night stand it was good thanks for hanging out see you later bye um so my relation i've never been in a long-term monogamous any kind of relationship i've never dated for more than one or two dates it's never been something that's been long term um but i would say i'm non-monogamous i'm not i'm not monogamous I don't, and I think that is partially because of disability. I think for me, it's attributed to disability because everybody thinks that as a disabled person, you should find one person to love you and you should find one person to marry you and you should find one person who, I get a lot of the time people saying to me like, don't you want to just find the one? Don't you want to find somebody to look past your disability and like see you for who you really are? And I'm always like, ew, no, if that's what being in a relationship with one person is, I never want that. <laughs> Because I want somebody who can call me a cripple and we can laugh about it later. Like, that's what I want. That's, like, but I also right. feel because I'm disabled, I have been denied opportunities to just 
and kind of be slutty and try things and just be so the idea of monogamy of like oh i can be with multiple people and try things like that's a cool idea but again for me it, it lies in the realm of ideology because most people don't want to date somebody with a disability because they're afraid of, of all those things and also so many places where in my case as a disabled queer guy so many places are not accessible like so many bars i can't get into so the places where i would go to be like hey i think mm. you're really cute let's like go back to my place and fuck or get to know each other or whatever it is i can't access those so my place of like sex is online which is very fickle and very you know people don't if you, they don't like you they swipe right and you're done or they swipe left and you're done and so like it right. the idea of being I've only been I've only had the idea of being in a relationship. I've never gotten to try that and I'm like I'm almost 34. So saying that feels weird now, but I'm also getting to a place where being single and disabled, I'm kind of okay with it now. Like I'm reaching a point where I'm like I don't need I mean it would be nice and if it happens great, but I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket and hope that it hope that this fairy tale romance. I think a lot of <laughs> this is turning into a way longer answer than I expected it to. Um I think <laughs> no, a lot right. of disabled people are also fed a really ableist idea of like you have to find the one person, you have to find like your true love. Like we're fed fairy tales because there are there is no fairy tale right now for kids that's like the disabled guy in a, in a or the disabled person in a wheelchair who isn't seeing anybody or who can't have a relationship because of X Y Z. There's none of that, so you just keep being fed old ideas, and then when you're in when you're a younger person, like when I was in, a teenager, you see all your cis hetero friends being like, hey, so I have a girlfriend now and it's a big deal. And so like I played with that idea, but inside I was like, wait, I'm queer and I want to sleep with everyone. How, like, what do I do <laughs> about that? And so like I'm, I'm 34, still having those feelings of like teenagehood because my sexuality has been so denied, which is, I mean, which is part of why I started doing this work because I wanted to get my dick sucked on occasion. Like that's why, that's really why I why I became a disability awareness consultant talking about sex because I was like, I'm horny all the time. I need an outlet to get it mm -hmm. out. Why don't I turn it into my job? One of the things that, that jumped out to me in what you were just saying was that idea of finding the one who's going to see past your disability and that you were kind of like, hey, but actually like that's, part of who I am that's not something you just kind of ignore that's not like that's kind of the fairy tale we're sold yeah. I guess and I think there's a lot of fairy tales that all of us are sold about the one and uh, which you know we're not going to go into all that I want to keep this a little bit specific here um, but something that uh, something that really jumped out to me with that was in an episode that you did about like gym culture and working out and uh, and disability and how like I was kind of shocked to hear this but how many people had said to you things like oh man you just gotta like get into the gym more and then you can get out of that wheelchair or like you'll you'll get past this or or you'll like overcome that I guess as if it were just sort of like any old struggle that anyone has rather than being you know a part of who you are that clearly you've like made that part of your identity um, I get it. I got it on the dance floor once. I got it on an app once. I got it. I get it on apps all the time. Like, hey, do you like go? Do you like go, do you want to go to the gym? And I'm just like, no, no, I, I, no, you can. <laughs> and like, I'll look at your muscles, and that's cool. But like, do I wanna? Do I wanna like work out with you? No. Um, but like I said in that episode, if you want to swim and like get me. <laughs> Right, Change if you want to hold me while in the water. Room. Yeah, like if you want to feed into my like gay porn fantasy, <laughs> sure, I'm all about that. Um, but I mean, the the idea that a, that health and ability is linked to sex, especially in queer male culture, is kind of gross. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really overdrawn. And then I come in and be like, hey, I don't want to... Like work out that way and like i talked in that episode also about like the positions that people use to like have better sex are linked to exercise uh, and right. linked to like muscle tone and all that stuff and so it's like no what if that doesn't work like what if that's not what if that doesn't work for you and so i think gym culture could be really fun if we said to disabled people like hey come to this disabled gym class 
and maybe we'll do this exercise so you can thrust better or maybe we'll do this exercise so you can like in with your disability do this better or this better or like and remove it from i'm gonna cure your disability if you do cardio yeah. to i'm gonna make sex feel better for you as a disabled person if we worked on this together well, hey, I think you just figured out your next career move is start teaching that class. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that was brilliant. That would also probably be a good way to get some more dates. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You're the, the, the sexy trainer teaching the exercise class. I'm down for that. I'm down <laughs> for that. Sure. Cool. Well, um, we're getting close to the end of our time here. One of our Patreon supporters was also a guest on your show. Uh, Kelly Bracken, who was on, I forget which episode, like 43 or something like that. It was a little while 49 ago. 49 40 Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but she was on your show too. So it was like, oh, cool. Look at all this overlap between, between these podcasts. Uh, so I'm really excited that we finally got to have you on. Um, I would definitely recommend listening to Andrew's podcast. Uh, Andrew, can you tell our listeners like, where they can find out more about all the stuff that you do? So many places. Uh, first, <laughs> www.andrewgerza.com. Secondly, uh, Andrew Gerza on Twitter. You can follow the podcast at DisAftDarkPod on Twitter as well. On Facebook, Disability After Dark is the podcast. And Andrew Gerza one is my stuff. Um, mm. Support triple content. Uh, and anybody who creates content needs to be supported because, you know, creating stuff like this is super hard. So... If you want to support yeah. this sh my show, patreon.com slash disability after dark. Uh, I don't have, what sucks about it is I don't have any cool like merch yet because also merch is exp it's expensive and getting it shipped <laughs> is expensive and like making it's expensive. <laughs> I was going to do buttons and I was like, whoa, no, the cost of buttons are like, tr no, no, no. So, <laughs> so right now, right now it's just like a nice yeah. shout out and I'm trying to find ways to do stuff that won't cost me. Uh, but patreon.com slash disability after dark like and yeah those are all the places awesome thank you so much yeah I and mean, if you're already a patron of ours and want to support more creators getting content out there that there isn't a lot of other stuff like it uh andrew's a great person to support for that absolutely awesome Thanks. all right thank you so much Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was an amazing, amazing interview. I learned a ton. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you learned a ton, Jace. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we'll get to talk to Andrew again at some point and see how he's doing, see how the podcast is doing uh, at another time on this show. So with that, if you would like to have your question or comment played on the show, then you can call 678-M-U-L-T-I-05. Wow, 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 I don't know what that was. And then like, wah, wah, wah. And then it's like the dubstep <laughs> remix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And leave us a voicemail, or you can send us an audio message at the Multiamory Facebook page. You can also email us at info at multiamory.com or send us a message on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. To support our show and join our private Facebook community, go to patreon.com slash multiamory. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Dedeker Winston, and me, Emily Matlack. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on the episodes page on multiamory.com. Hey, this is Dan Savage from the Savage Lovecast and Savage Love. You're listening to a Swing Set podcast at Swing Set FM. <laughs> <laughs>